On the morning of Friday, December 18, 1970, investigators were unprepared for the horrific scene they found at 37 Calle Jesus Nazareño. They were in the town of Santa Cruz on the island of Tenerife. This bloodbath would come to be known as the most brutal crime to occur on the island. But let us begin at the beginning in Dresden, Germany. Little is known about the childhoods of the Alexander family's matriarch and patriarch. What we do know is that Dagmar and Harald Alexander met and married in Dresden, Germany. They later moved to Hamburg, where Harald found work as a stonemason and became a disciple of George Guillet, who was the self-appointed leader of the Lorbor Society. Jacob Lorbor was a Christian mystic who promoted liberal universalism. Liberal Christian universalism emphasizes the all-inclusive love of God and is more open to finding truth in non-Christian spiritual traditions while remaining generally Christ-centered. Some liberal Christian universalists believe in mystical philosophies, such as the pre-existence and reincarnation of the soul and the law of attraction. Jacob thought of himself as God's scribe. In 1840, he began hearing an inner voice and started to transcribe what it told him. He believed his writings were a dictation of the voice of Jesus Christ. Jacob believed that through the imitation of Christ, the individual can learn to love God and his neighbor. When a soul is reborn, it leaves the body and rises to the new Jerusalem. Christ will then return to earth to recreate and establish the millennium. When Christ appears, Lucifer and the souls left on earth will have to choose a side. Those who refuse God and continue in rebellion will be destroyed. Catholics and a large part of Christian groups, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, all have a somewhat similar belief of what will happen in the end. I'm not sure what I believe, but I'm leaning towards this all being a simulation. What do you believe? Let me know in the comments below. After Jacob's death, his revelations were passed on to other chosen individuals who would continue the tradition of writing all that they heard from Jesus Christ. One of these chosen individuals was George Rile. Rile's sect of the Lorbor Society was based on a severe spirituality and held the belief that those who were not members of the group were evil. Harald Alexander took care of Rile while he was dying. When he passed away, Hagal told his wife, Dagma, that he was the heir to Rile's revelations and was therefore the next chosen leader of the Lorbor Society. He also inherited Rile's most prized possession, a portable harmonium with an accordion mechanism. This would eventually be used to compose a grim soundtrack to accompany the impending day of carnage. Dagma shared her husband's beliefs and accepted his proclamation of leadership without question. When their son Frank was born in 1954, Harald informed her that Frank was now the chosen prophet of God and all of his commands were to be obeyed by everyone in the household. Harald would have to obey Frank too but he would also have some autonomy as his advisor. When Frank was 12, he began to show an interest in girls. So under his father's advisement, he began to have sex with his mother. Anyone outside of their religious group were considered dirty and were therefore unacceptable partners for a prophet. After years of isolation, their religious group now consisted only of their family. Frank next began assaulting his 14-year-old sister, Marina, 
And finally, his 11-year-old twin sisters, Petra and Sabine. His father soon joined in the assaults, sometimes abusing his son too. This incest was somehow leaked to the public, and as people gossiped, the authorities prepared to make arrests. However, Dagmar received a small inheritance of 20,000 marks. This is about $310,000, $256,000 euros, or 220,000 pounds today. Harald and Dagmar used the money to quickly flee from prosecution to the island of Tenerife, specifically to 37 Calle Jesus Nazareno in the town of Santa Cruz. They claimed that God had commanded their move. Tenerife is the largest and most populous island of the Canary Islands, which are all a part of Spain. Francisco Franco Bahamonde was a Spanish general who led the nationalist forces in overthrowing the Second Spanish Republic during the Spanish Civil War and came to rule over Spain from 1939 to 1975 as a dictator. Before his rise to power, Franco was posted to Tenerife in 1936 as a way to distance him from Spain and limit the growing influence they saw he had. However, he still managed to collaborate in a military coup that would result in the Spanish Civil War. The Canaries fell to the nationalists in July 1936. In the 1950s, the difficulties of the post-war years caused thousands of islanders to emigrate to Cuba and other parts of Latin America. Nevertheless, by the 1960s, the island of Tenerife was making great headway and rebuilding itself. Tenerife has a tropical climate, beautiful beaches, and in the late 60s and early 70s, it began to bustle with tourists. The tourist boom of the 1960s boosted the economy of the island, making it cozy, exciting, and diverse. Visitors to the island tended to be mature in age and primarily German and Spanish. Once on the island, the Alexander family kept to themselves, much like they did in Germany. Their neighbors knew little of them outside of the sounds of their harmonium playing and the Alexanders praying at all hours of the day and night. Frank began working for a shipping firm, and the twins, Sabine and Petra, obtained positions as maids at the home of Dr. Walter Trankler. Dagmar, Harold, and their eldest daughter, Marina, remained unemployed. On an afternoon in December 1970, the family had been on the island of Tenerife for about 10 months, Dr. Trankler was surprised with a visit from Harald and Frank. Their clothes were caked in what appeared to be mud. They asked the doctor if they could speak to Sabine, who was working with Petra on that day. When she came to them, the doctor overheard Harald saying, Sabine, dear, we wanted you to know at once. Frank and I have just finished killing your mother and your sisters. Sabina responded by grasping her father's blood-stained hands and saying, I'm sure you have done what was necessary. Harald then noticed the shocked doctor had listened into their conversation and told him, ah, you've overheard. We've killed my wife and other daughters. It was the hour of killing. The doctor then came to the grisly realization that what he'd originally assumed was mud and dirt on the men's clothes was actually human blood. Observing the family's behavior was even more off-putting. They were calm and talked about the murders as if nothing was wrong. The doctor immediately raced into his house to call the police. 
the police took Harald and Frank into custody. When authorities entered 37 Calle Jesus Nazareño, they were swallowed into the most gruesome scene they had ever witnessed. Upon questioning, Frank and Harald revealed what had caused them to slaughter most of their family on December 16, 1970. On that afternoon, Frank, who was 16, had caught his mother, 41-year-old Dagma, looking at him in what he felt was a demonic, defiant, and strange way. So he decided to take a wooden hanger from the closet and brutally bludgeoned her until she was unconscious and dying. At this point, Harald had realized that the hour of killing had begun and began to maniacally play the organ in tribute to accompany the massacre. Frank then moved to the next room and attacked his older sister, Marina, who was 18. He told 15-year-old Petka to wait her turn as he beat Marina about the head with the hanger until he believed her to be dead. Petra was the last to be slaughtered, and like his other victims, she complied fully with his wicked demands. None of the women showed any signs of fighting back. After they were all beaten to death, Frank's father, Halad, joined him in the process of mutilating the women's bodies. They methodically moved from one body to the next and used pruning shears and razor blades to remove their genitals and breasts and nailed these parts to the walls. They removed Dagma's heart, then tied it to a string and also nailed it to a wall. Finally, they disemboweled the two sisters. When asked why the women didn't defend themselves, Frank and Harald informed them that the women were extremely faithful and had already accepted that they had to die. Frank had spoken to them about the hour of killing for some time now, and he told them that it could happen at any time. He had explained to them that during the hour of killing, the woman would be murdered and then mutilated because they were unclean. After the ritual, they believed that the woman's souls would go directly to heaven. Dagma, Petka, and Marina accepted the brutal murders as their fates because they believed they were serving God. Frank and Harald trusted that they had done the right thing in sending the woman to heaven. When the case was brought to trial, the prosecutor requested the death penalty for 39-year-old Harald in 40 years of minor imprisonment for 16-year-old Frank. However, the court acquitted the defendants of the crimes of parricide and murder by reason of insanity. Psychiatrists believed that Harald suffered from chronic delusional schizophrenia and that Frank either suffered from a psychic contagion or an induced delusional disorder. Let's first take a closer look at Halal's diagnosis of chronic delusional schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is defined as being a long-term mental illness involving a breakdown in the connections between thought, emotion, and behavior. This leads to faulty perception, such as hallucinations and or delusions inappropriate actions and feelings, withdrawal from reality and personal relationships into fantasy and delusion, and a sense of mental fragmentation. The cause of schizophrenia is yet to be confirmed, but at this point, research supports two causes. The first cause is most likely various genes, since it tends to run in families. The second cause is environmental, since it's known that extreme environmental stress, like academic stress or substance abuse, can trigger the onset of schizophrenia. 
Hallucinations and delusions are among the most common symptoms of schizophrenia. Delusions are defined as beliefs that conflict with reality. There are six types of delusions. Persecutory delusions, or when a person believes a person, group, or organization is mistreating or harming them or someone close to them, despite contradictory evidence. Erotomanic delusions, when a person believes another is in love with them, despite no evidence. This other person is often a celebrity or person in power. Somatic delusions, when a person believes they have an illness or their body is affected by a strange condition, despite contradictory evidence. Grandiose delusions, when a person believes they have superior abilities or qualities, such as talent, fame, or wealth, despite no evidence. This person has an overinflated sense of worth, power, knowledge, or identity. They could believe they have a great talent or made an important discovery. Jealous. A person with this type believes their spouse or sexual partner is unfaithful. And finally, mixed. These people have two or more types of delusions that have been listed. Hallucinations are defined as experiences and sensations that are not understandable to others. To the person experiencing them, however, they may seem real, urgent, and vivid. Hallucinations are sometimes categorized as secondary delusions if they involve having a false belief in the voice they are hearing or other sensation they are experiencing. There are four types of hallucinations. Auditory hallucinations are most commonly experienced by people with schizophrenia and may include hearing voices, sometimes multiple voices, or other sounds like whispering or murmuring. Voices may seem angry or urgent and often make demands on the hallucinating person. Visual hallucinations involve seeing objects, people, lights, or patterns that are not actually present. Visualizing dead loved ones, friends, or other people they know can be particularly distressing. Visual perception may be altered as well, resulting in difficulty judging things like colors or how far or near an object is or how deep or shallow something may be. Olfactory hallucinations involve the sense of smell or taste, both good or bad, that are not actually present. And lastly, tactile hallucinations are feelings of movement or sensations on your body that are not actually present, such as hands on your body or insects crawling around or inside you. Next, let's tackle Frank Alexander's diagnosis of a psychic contagion or an induced delusional disorder. A psychic contagion is a transmission of a nervous disorder or lesser psychological symptoms by imitation, like in mass hysteria. Mass hysteria is a condition affecting a group of people characterized by excitement or anxiety, irrational behavior or beliefs, or inexplicable symptoms of illness. This condition begins in the mind rather than in the body. Physical symptoms can manifest as a result and are often not imagined, but very much real. Mass hysteria is caused by psychological stress. Induced delusional disorder or shared paranoid disorder is also known as folie de, which can be translated to a madness shared by two. However, the case of the Alexander family would be closer to folie en famille, 
or family madness. This syndrome is usually diagnosed when two or more individuals live in close proximity to each other. There are two primary ways to describe how the delusional belief comes to be held by more than one person. Fully imposé is where a dominant person who is known as the primary inducer or principal initially forms a delusional belief during a psychotic episode and imposes it on other people who are known as the secondary acceptor or associate. In this diagnosis, Harald would be the primary and Frank the secondary. The assumption is that the secondary person might not have become deluded if they were left to his or her devices. If both parties are admitted to a hospital separately, then the delusions in the secondary person with induced beliefs usually resolve without need of medication. The second method in sharing a delusional belief is folly simultanee. This is when two people who suffer independently from psychosis influence the content of each other's delusions. The delusions then become identical or strikingly similar. Polysimultane can also occur when two people predisposed to delusional psychosis mutually trigger symptoms in each other. There are two causes of induced delusional disorder. The first cause, as with most mental illnesses, is stress. The second cause is social isolation because people who are isolated together tend to become dependent on those they are with. They also don't have others calmly reminding them that their delusions are either impossible or unlikely. A majority of people that develop shared delusional disorder are genetically predisposed to mental illness, but the predisposition alone isn't enough to develop a mental illness. Harald and Frank were transferred to the Penitentiary Psychiatric Assistance Center section of Carabanchel Prison, which was located in Madrid, Spain. They were also ordered to pay Sabine 900,000 pesetas, the modern day equivalent of $45,000 or 32,000 pounds or 37,000 euros. After being taken out of her father's custody, Sabine chose to go live in a convent. She's thought to have changed her name because she's never been heard from again. 23 years after being admitted to the psychiatric facility, Harald and Frank both managed to escape from the asylum in the early 90s. Interpol filed a search and arrest warrant in 1995, but they were unable to find them. Some sources suggest that the father and son returned to Germany, where the Lorbor Society was still active, but their whereabouts are unknown to this day. If alive today, Harald would be 90, Frank would be 66, and Sabine would be 65. My final thoughts are on trying to determine who were the victims and who were the predators in this case. The daughters were obvious victims of their circumstances. They were born into a family with violent beliefs. They were groomed from birth to assume those beliefs as their own, even to their own detriment. They were given no chance at developing independent fulfilling and happy lives. If Sabine is still alive today, I sincerely hope that she's living a satisfying, peaceful life and that her world is filled with all the love her younger years were lacking. Halald, Frank, and Dagma, on the other hand, are more confusing cases. The father, Halald, 
may have suffered from chronic delusional schizophrenia, but the things he subjected his family to were, in my opinion, unforgivable. He raped every member of his family, including his prophet's son. He subjected them all to severe psychological abuse and took part in their brutal murders. In spite of popular assumptions, Having schizophrenia doesn't make you an inherently violent person. Most patients with schizophrenia will never be violent. Schizophrenia actually increases the likelihood of being the victim of crime and exploitation. For every schizophrenic person who commits a homicide, 100 will unfortunately commit suicide. A person can be aggressive and have an anger problem and not have schizophrenia. I'm not a psychologist though, so the most I can do is classify Harald as being an asshole who happened to have a mental illness. Frank's case isn't as clear though. According to his diagnosis, he most likely would have ended up being a normal kid if he'd grown up without the influence of his father and mother. He was named the most powerful in the household, but I doubt he had more power than his father, who worked as his advisor. The psychological manipulation and sexual abuse he suffered from his father and mother likely turned him into the sociopathic monster he became. People with antisocial personality disorder also known as sociopaths, likely know what they're doing is wrong, but their moral compass is weak. They have a conscience, it's just not strong enough to stop their bad behavior. But experts don't think people with psychopathy have a conscience. There are four main causes of sociopathy and psychopathy. The first is the brain. Studies show that there may be a problem with the circuitry that controls behavior in people with this condition. Research also shows that certain parts of the brains of people with psychopathy are smaller. That includes the areas that control empathy, moral decision-making, guilt, and embarrassment. The second is genetics. You're more likely to get this disorder if someone in your family, such as a parent, has it. Third is sex. Antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy can happen in females, but they are much more likely to show up in males. Last is the environment. There's some evidence that people with this disorder don't learn the difference between right and wrong as they're growing up. It's hard to come to a firm conclusion because the abuse and manipulation was so extreme. This makes it difficult to determine if he was simply a psychopath to begin with. My conclusion with Frank is that when I think of him, I feel a mix of sadness and uneasiness. I feel that Harold never really passed his power down to his son, and ultimately, Frank was groomed into a weapon his father would eventually use to terrorize and wipe out his family. Lastly, we come to Dagma. Yes, she was a murder victim, but how much of a victim was she in life? I've never been part of a cult, so I won't pretend to understand how it affects your mental health. However, I have experienced an abusive relationship before, and while I was in it, I changed into a completely different person, and the concessions I made to reject all of my instincts and common sense in exchange for scraps of love were wild. Nonetheless, I don't understand how any amount of abuse and indoctrination would bring someone to assault a child, let alone their own son. 
she was a victim of brainwashing, but she was also the adult in the situation. In this instance, I feel that maybe Frank was more of a victim than she was. However, as with Frank, the waters are murky and my conclusion isn't clear. I'm not a mother, so I can only go off of what other mothers tell me. But wouldn't the motherly instinct tell you to take your kids and run? Religion and love are powerful drugs and can morph you into someone unrecognizable if you let them. This can be both a positive and a negative thing. In this case, her love for Halald and her religion affected her common sense and decency in an extremely negative way. That's all I can say about the tragic and horrific case of the Alexander family. What do you think about the family and who was at fault? I would love to read your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for visiting my channel. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more content. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. I'll be posting mostly true crime, but also other mysteries and conspiracy theories at least twice a week. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you soon. And I hope you all have peaceful and fulfilling weeks. Bye.